guys, and welcome back to We Want to Know. This week, we're interviewing Heather Green, creator and owner of Silly Farm Supplies. I hope you guys enjoy. All right, first question. So, you started face painting when you were 14. Mm -hmm. How did you know this would be something you loved doing as a career? The funny thing is I hated it at first, and I only did it because I was a 14-year-old, about to be 15, and I wanted a car. So uh, my aunt, who was a clown, said, if I teach you to face paint, you could buy your own car. But I hated it because I was embarrassed, because nobody liked clowns, okay? Uh, so I said, well, I don't, if I don't have to be a full clown, meaning wear full white face and gloves, then I can do it. I can figure it out. And it turned out that I really loved people. I love parties. I love birthday cake. So uh, I would say after about two, three years, I finally decided like, oh, I can see myself doing this and, uh, and, and taking it further than just like a part-time job. I really had a lot of fun as a face painter. Once I found out that I didn't have to be a clown. <laughs> so that was like the tipping point for me, so yeah. You and your aunt own this company. Mm -hmm. How did she inspire you when you were young, and how does she inspire you today? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. So my aunt was a clown, and she started Silly Farm purely by coincidence, because we would go to clown conventions, and she was the only one face painting. So they would say, um, where did you get those face paint? And she would literally cut up face paint and build kits herself, little ones. And I would travel with her, because that was fun. And I started helping her. And then when I was about, I would say 18, maybe 18, 17, 18, she started Silly Farm in her kitchen. And she would just make a bunch of kits and take them on the road and sell them. And then I was going to college at that time at FSU and I was studying business. And then um, I would meet her on the summers and work in the store. She moved into a little store, no bigger than this room. And I would always work with her and I would still travel and I had a really good time. And I learned so much from her. She was a terrible business person in the sense of bookkeeping and taxes and inventory, but she was always amazing with people. So she uh, treated everybody with love, kindness, respect. She sat, she talked to them. And I think that helped me build up the best, not only work ethic, but uh, business practices that helped me build my business in a time where social media didn't exist. So right now, it's really easy to be everyone's friend on Facebook and write nice comments, but back in the day, you couldn't do that. You just had to literally go out there and be nice to people. And I learned that from her. I also learned the love of face painting. I w didn't grow up with an art background. I wasn't an artist. I was a finance student and I loved math, uh, but she taught me how to love color and people and creativity. So the crazy thing is we still paint together. So even to this day, she still inspires me on many levels, not just with art, but still her like love for people, which is very, in her love for kids. I would think after all this time, she'd be like, oh, I don't want to see kids. But she still loves them and she still treats people good. Um, she doesn't do the day-to-day -day at Silly Farm anymore, so uh, she's here you know, once or twice a week. But that's good too, because it gives her time to still be creative and go into semi-retirement, if that's what you <laughs> like to call it. So now I get to kind of live out both of our dreams by growing the business and helping support her and also doing what we love and staying true to that by still being really good to people. That's like my best business advice is just keep on being good to people. It pays off in the long run. Do you get to travel a lot as a face painter and what is your favorite place you've traveled to? I do get to travel quite a lot as a face painter. Um, I started a YouTube channel, uh, I think a little bit about 11 years ago, 10, 11 years ago, and that helped me create an international following, which then in turn they invite me to come and teach at different places. So I get to travel all over the world, which I never thought possible. Growing up, I, I never even went on a plane, honestly. So uh, when I turned 18, 19, and we started traveling, and I started traveling with Marcella to conventions and not, I was like, this is amazing. Um, one of my favorite trips has been to Australia. The Australian face painters are beyond incredible and very talented. So we had a great time. It was my first time seeing a kangaroo up close and a koala and sharks, lots of sharks. Yeah, they love sharks there. So uh, that was one of my most memorable trips. But anytime I travel, I have a good time. Even though I don't like to fly, but I love to travel because you get to meet 
um, people hands-on and that brings it back to where I first started which was the way I built the company by just literally hugging and being nice to everybody so I do travel quite a lot sometimes two three times a month so yeah so I'm tired <laughs> yeah you've been posting videos um, on YouTube for over 11 years yeah. on your personal channel how have you seen yourself grow over time in posting well, when I first started the channel, it was literally because my sister had just started going to college and she asked me how to face paint her face for a football game. So I took a little camera and it was a terrible quality video and I made a very fast video. And then people started writing me saying, can you show me how to make a heart? Can you show me how to make a kitty? And I would make their really crappy quality if you look at the first ones. And I left them up instead of taking them down because I wanted people to see that I started somewhere and then from that point I've been able to improve and develop and improve my editing skills, um, my camera presence, like all those things are important for people to see where I've been and where I'm at right now and that's just through consistency and dedication and hard work. Um, because some of the new YouTubers, they're extremely talented but they have a lot more tools at their disposal. So it's hard to gauge how much is real talent versus how much is um, them just emulating other people. So I'm grateful for the experience over the years. Like I went from uh, editing with, oh my gosh, a free program. I think it was like something for Adobe. It was like an Adobe finisher. I don't know. <laughs> Up until iMovie and then John taught me all about Final Cut. So now I'm grateful that I know how to do more than just, you know, write my name at the beginning. Yeah. I can make fancy effects. I think I single-handedly keep Final uh Final Effects Cut, some program in, that you can buy transitions. I keep them in business because I buy so many. So, oh, yeah. yeah. So, yes, I definitely have seen a lot of growth over those years. Yeah, your first one was a snowman. I saw it. Oh, and my I was gosh. Like, oh, I can do that. Like, anyone can do that. <laughs> oh, my God. I yeah. have zero artistic abilities. I'm like, I can actually do that. Well, you know, I love you, too. The comments are great. You know, I had to turn off the comments, um, uh, notifications for comments, because, you know, there's a lot of people who say, some rather mean things, but the great news is I don't care. <laughs> uh, so, you know, uh, people say things just to get a reaction out of you or to be mean, and sometimes it's kids saying things that they don't know. So I found that I care less when I just turn off the notifications and then I can just share what I love and the people who want to watch it, watch it. If they don't, I don't care anyways, you know? So that, that's one piece of advice definitely I share with people. Just don't take it too serious. You do lots of um, live streams to teach your followers about different techniques and all. In your opinion, what is the most beneficial thing about um, live streams and what is the difference between live streams and normal regular YouTube videos? Well, that's a great question, actually. So Faba TV, as you can see behind us, um, kind of was inspired by my YouTube channel. So with YouTube, when I first started, the longest that your videos could be were, I think, like eight minutes. Um, and then you had to work your way up to like a, like a director's channel where you had to have so many viewers and no strikes against you. And then you could go up to like 15 minutes. So that didn't give me a lot of time to create full content. So that's why I started Faba TV, which is an online uh, learning platform using video and we film classes. And one way to get people to experience Faba TV was to do a monthly live class where it's free for anybody to log on and watch. The reason I wanted to do a live class was because it gives you a chance to see everything in real time because um, you know the with the modern technology of Photoshop and filters everything can be amazing after you you know Photoshop it and fix it to death so I wanted artists to feel inspired and empowered by seeing artwork that's done in real time because everything's not always perfect so if you do it in real time and it comes out ugly it's gonna that's the reality of it so um, also how long it takes you to do something so you'll see a beautiful face painted tiger and you don't know if it took them two years or two minutes so the live component shows a realistic look at it the downside to live streaming is you're completely solely dependent on the power of your internet connection so um, even though I pay for the best internet here this particular spot where we built our studio is like a dead zone for internet so our Wi-Fi would be choppy and it would just um, kind of hurt the quality of the stream 
but I love live because you can correspond and you can talk and you can interact with people. I hate live stream because I can only depend on the internet and sometimes the internet won't let me be great. <laughs> so it's a great tool. Um, I think it's an even better tool if you use it sparingly. I think sometimes too much live can be an overkill. Uh, so I love having the mixture of both. I think that helps me. Okay. <laughs> um, so being a woman in business, do you think that you have to work harder to make yourself known? And what are some strategies for girls that want to start their own business? Um, that's a, a really great question. So here's the thing with being a woman in business. You ha face 10 times more challenges because most women are also mothers and wives, uh, which adds a whole different level of, of pressure and stress because um, you're, you're young, so you don't see it, but in the workplace, I've worked in corporate America, um, the, my male counterparts would be asked to go on trips and be able to stay late and no one ever was like, well, what happened to your kids? Who's taking care of your kids? But as a woman, that's the first question I get asked. It's almost like the judgmental component that comes with it, like, how are you working so much? When, well, who's taking care of your kids? Like, they don't have a father or a family mm -hmm. to help. So the first part that makes it harder to be a businesswoman is there's just so much stereotypes attached to my official role, which is your first role should be a wife and mother, and your second role should be a businesswoman. But they, they go hand in hand because I can't afford to provide for my family if I'm not working. So um, that's the first challenge, and it's a real challenge because I have young kids, so I'm always like, do they do their homework? Do they take a bath? And then, is my business okay? I have to travel and teach. So juggling the pressures of society and also being a mother and a wife is hard. Um, the second thing that you struggle with is, as a woman in a retail business, I have to procure a lot of products, so I sell other people's brands. And when I call to establish like a contact with them, sometimes since I sound young and I used to look younger than I look, they'd be like, oh, little girl, you know. It wasn't the immediate respect that they would naturally just afford a man. They would be like, um, and even now when we get solicitors for Comcast or AT&T, they come in and they'll be like, can I please speak to your boss? Like without ever even considering that I might be the boss, you know? So there's definitely um, a difference in the way that you're approached, the way that you're respected, but I think in order to get respect, you have to give respect. So, you know, um, the only thing that really has driven me crazy over the years is if someone like does this, cause I'm short. So <laughs> if a guy's like, oh my God, I'm like, are you patting an adult on their head? <laughs> like that's such a weird feeling for me and it's happened like two to three times in my life um, in business settings where I was like, I would never give you my business after that. But other than that, you know, I'm really good about being very direct with people and I think that lends itself to them being like, okay, she's not um, here to play or she's not here to, you know, let me walk all over her, which is, Something you gotta work on as a woman, you know, business is not for the faint heart. So you better be able to be like, please don't ever pat me on my face again. Okay, we got it. Mm -hmm. And you know, then, then you can, then, then they feel awkward and then they have no choice but to be nice to you and give you respect. <laughs> so yeah, I had, to, I had to beat up a few men. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Very cool. Also, also, let me not skip this over. Um, in, as a woman business owner, you'll find that a lot of things that are acceptable for men are definitely not acceptable for women. Like women will make a lot of exceptions for things that men do that they don't afford that to us. So as a face painter, as a teacher, if I'm ever late, it's the end of the world, they're gonna crucify me. But my male teachers, instructors, they can be late, they can, you know, do things half-assed and they don't get called on it. But as a woman, it's always like, well, she knew better and she was supposed to and I'm like, Hey, wait a second, you know, so there's just some double standards that exist, but they're not exclusive to business. They're actually just there in life. And every day with like the Me Too movement, you're seeing that women are definitely getting stronger and um, m becoming hopefully more equal in everyone's eyes. And speaking of the whole girl power movement, um, you support a lot of female business owners. Like I saw on your channel that you did a review about the Craft and Go mm -hmm. that was made by a female, right? Yes. And so how is it important for female entrepreneurs to support each other in such like a male-driven business? Um, it's, well, I think one, I think support, women supporting women is 
crucial in every area of your life, not even just in the business realm, but showing up for your friends um, and showing your daughter, showing your kids what it means to pay it forward because we all learn by example. But um, knowing and being in a position where I've always, where I've been a business uh, woman, business own, owner, I like to make sure that I pay it forward. Like Cynthia from Craft and Go, uh, it's a fantastic product. She created it. She uh, put in the R and D to build it. So because I see the value of her hard work, there's n gives me no better pleasure than to see her succeed too. And in turn, she turns around and supports Silly Farm. So it's like a really good. Um, like a really good system that works when you support women business because what I find in the male world sometimes is that it becomes competitive versus supportive where sometimes people think well if we're both doing it well we're competition but I see it as we both can make money together we can grow together and we understand that about each other because there's a nurturing component to being a woman right like it's just in us that we're like oh my god I love her so much and I want to help her so that works in my favor many times especially in a women oriented field like the face painting industry is mostly women so if I don't understand and cater to that demographic I wouldn't be able to stay in business so I have to always say how can I give back um, many like my customer a woman made this shirt for me she's one of our customers she opened a t-shirt company I saw a few of her shirts, I said, I need to buy some. And she made me and my staff shirts and I'm able to give her business and she's able to give me business and see how it works out good. Yeah, and I love this shirt. It's this, cute. This shirt is like six years old and look at how good it still looks. Wow. I know, the pink is like in it to win it. So. That's so cool. Yeah, I'm very happy about that. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, so you're the co-producer of the Face and Body Art International Convention. So yeah. how did that happen? Like how, what was the process in creating that? Well, um, when we first started, like I said, there were no, uh, there was, there was no face painters. It was literally just clowns, and clowns were do face painting, magic, and balloons. And I always hated being a clown because I didn't do magic and I wasn't great at balloons. I loved face painting. So what I ended up doing was talking to Marcella and saying we should do a face painting convention. So she partners. I was still in college, and she partnered with a fellow clown to create the first convention and they did a face painting convention and at first no hotels wanted to take us because they were like body painting paint it's going to get on the walls so it was hard to get it off the ground and then after i graduated college then her partner decided to go back to school and i took over um, with her we've been producing it for the past uh, 12 years so it's been a um a crazy insane ride it's a lot of work because catering to 500 artistic people at one time is exhausting but it's like sleepaway art camp for adults you know we come together we paint we enjoy we are creative together we inspire each other so I love it and it's amazing but it's coming up in a year and I'm already sweating you know <laughs> yes I'm like sweating already thinking about it I'm like because we design everything from the t-shirts to the bags to the curriculum to a gala like it's a lot of planning that mentally goes into making sure that 500 people have a good time and that's not easy to do you know like there's so many people who are like gluten free we you know gluten free vegan <laughs> no cheese add pepper like i'm like oh how about we just serve ice cubes so you know yeah, it's a yeah. little difficult but still fun I don't know if you're gonna have the answer to this yet because it's still in a year, so you're mm -hmm. still planning it. But um, the theme is the spirit of Aloha. I saw yes. on their website. So how will you mix that theme into the whole convention? Do you know yet? Well, every year when we pick a theme, we do it like literally. We close our eyes and we say to ourselves, you know, what brings the biggest smile to your face? And after last convention, we got to see so many people in such a good space, meaning like really enjoying the love of the art. And we then we say to ourselves, what's popular to paint? And the reality is everyone loves painting flowers. Like they just don't go away. So we were talking to our friend who had just come back from Hawaii and she goes, we should do something Hawaiian with aloha it means love to them. So we were like, okay, what about the spirit of aloha? Because it means the spirit of love. And there's so many, um, so many colors that come from the island Hawaii. There's so much inspiration that gets driven from flowers and Polynesian culture and Moana. So it worked its way out, you know, it worked itself out and we're really excited about it because we did like a body painting shoot and face painting shoot of like for ads, for postcards, and they came out amazing. So like the idea of all these hibiscus flowers and lays and 
um, you know, beautiful wreaths, like it all just lend itself to like getting more excited because that's what we like to paint anyways, you know? Yeah. Glitter flowers, pink, pretty, think about that and think about that just everywhere. So we're excited. All right, and final question. Um, one piece of advice for any struggling artist or struggling entrepreneur out there that you think is like key when you want to start? Uh, oh, that's a great question. So my best advice is, um, well, there's two pieces to it. One, you gotta be, you gotta love it. You gotta hundred percent own it because I believe you can make a living doing anything that you love. Really, I most people when I tell them that I sell face paint, they're like, "What do you do?" Nobody believes that it could have been done at this level, and. Um, I mean, I feel I still have room to grow too, but I'm grateful I have 25 employees, I have four companies, so I feel like if I could do that from face painting, anything can be done for any realm of artist. But you gotta be 100% committed to it. Like, you can't be scared or embarrassed to present your product, your idea, because who's, if you don't fully believe in it, who's gonna believe in it? Why would anyone take a chance? Like, um, I've had to put myself in positions where I have to like 100% own it in order to get people to buy it and that's not easy to do because people are embarrassed of rejection. So you got to say, I'm not going to feel rejected, I'm going to give it my best shot and be 100% committed. And then the second thing is you got to be ready to uh, be in it for the long haul and know that every hour um, can't really be monetized. So you know, for the first year when I started Silly Farm, I said I am going to invest every single dollar back into the business and I'll, I'll just face paint on the weekends and use that money to live. So yeah, I was struggled. It's hard to pay your bills, you know, just on weekend work. But I did it because I wanted to reinvest in the business. And if I counted every hour, then I would have given up because it would have been like, I'm not making money, I'm losing. So, you know, some really good advice that I saw from an Obama um, uh, interview was he said you know when he first ran for office not the presidency but state senate he said that he lost miserably and his wife told him like give it up you're not meant to be in politics and he said that during the campaign he did so much grassroots work like he met with the boys and girls club he met with local parents he met with doctors he met he learned so much so he said even though I lost I judge it by the work that I did, not the results that I got, like not just the outcome of the election. So he said next time when I ran for state senate and I won, I was better prepared. So you know, if I would have given up the first year, I would have never succeeded or be the president today. So for me, I look at it in the big picture, like if you're committed to it and you're dedicated to it and you believe 100% in it, um, then you'll, it's like it's if you, if, you, if you build it, it'll come. So you know, I tell people that all the time, like. You can't just be motivated by money or fame because those things are temporary. You have to be motivated by like, this is your passion, you love it, and you could do it every day without counting the hours. And then I really believe that you'll be able to make a living because I meet people who do crazy things. Like I meet people who literally just dye the hair on horses. Like they color the horse's hair to make them more like unicorns. And that's a real job and they're busy. So they get flown all over the world to just like color horse hair. So who'd have thought that that's a business? But it is, because that person, they love that business. So um, that's what I suggest, just make sure that you love it if you're gonna consider yourself in it to win it, you know what I mean? So that's, hopefully I was able to answer your question well. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. that's awesome. Oh good. That's all we got for you, thank you so uh, much. No problem, oh. give you a hug. Oh, oh. oh give her a hug. Don't get up, see. Uh, yeah. yeah, don't don't even worry about hopping down because also I forgot that my microphone is down. Oh, cute. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you. Of course.